The doctrine of reincarnation and karma developed among a people who are known to have been profound students of astrology. But we have certain points, I think, that we should clarify. In the ages when these doctrines were in the formation, uh, there was no essential science dedicated to the study of the universe except astrology. Astronomy as we know it today did not exist. And one more recent astronomer, somewhat embarrassed over the background of his science, has stated that astronomy was the same child of a mad parent. This is one uh, simple way of pointing out that from mistakes, great truths arise. The study of astronomy in antiquity could never have held the interest of the people had it been concerned primarily with the chemical analyses of distant stars or an effort to measure the direction of the continuum. Uh, these abstractions broke a pattern to which antiquity was consistently addicted. Whenever the ancient discovered anything, his first question was, what does it mean to me? What does it mean in my personal life? What does the enlargement of our understanding of the universe mean to us now? How can we use it to live better, to think better, and to be better? Thus, in old times, the universe was explored only that man could come to understand more clearly the laws governing his own conduct. It was assumed that man was part of the universe. Whatever rules and regulations existed in space applied to man, and he must live according to them and be obedient, for these laws represented the will of God in action, the continual motion of universal principles. This also led to a second consideration, namely that all laws and all principles in operation are not only mechanical principles or mechanical processes, they are also intelligent processes, conscious processes, laws and principles that can be and should be interpreted in terms of their moral and psychic value, and not merely as the elements of a universal machinery. Even today, the most simple machine that we invent, or the most complicated one, if we considered it philosophically, it would give us a code of morality, because these things are lawful or they will not operate. Some machines teach us cooperation, others teach us coordination, others reveal to us processes applicable to our own bodies, to our minds, to our souls. It is said that the early Romans, confronted with the problem of creating water supplies for great cities, patterned their system of aqueducts from a study of the arterial system of the human body. And they developed the two prongs of this, the arterial circulation and the venous circulation, creating from one their aqueducts and from the other their sewerage systems. And until they had recognized this law operating in man, they could not apply it to the needs of community existence. Thus it is that older peoples, forever observant, and building their philosophies very largely upon observed phenomena, became keenly interested in observing all that they could. 
recognizing that in this way they could advance the social state of human society. If, therefore, we wish to take this position, I think we can say that astrology, to them, was a kind of moral astronomy. It was the psychology of the heavens rather than its physiology. It was the spiritual meaning of the sidereal complex rather than a mere attempt to penetrate the anatomy of space. Out of this moral meaningfulness, there, there evolved a number of related systems of thought. At a very early time, astrology seems to have formed a strong partnership with religion, something that again rather differs from our modern viewpoint on these things. Among those nations where astrology was originally practiced, were the highest religious peoples and philosophical peoples existing at the time. We know that astrology developed among the Grecians, uh, that it was more or less brought to the Romans through the contact with Greek civilization. It developed among Oriental peoples, particularly in India and China. It also developed in North Africa, in the schools of Northern Egypt, as Alexandria, Memphis, and other great culture centers. As one has observed historically, no nation of antiquity ever reached a high degree of civilization without the development of a science of prognostics through the stars. Today we can say to ourselves, to what degree do these old beliefs survive? Are we correct in assuming that we have an adequate perspective either on the belief in astrology or on the belief in reincarnation and karma? I think our perspective is rather inadequate for the most part, although perhaps we are better equipped for a larger perspective than ever before in history. We can say to ourselves, who believes in astrology today? And if we are to read the popular journals against the subject, we may say very few people. If we read the publications published by various astrological groups, we can say quite a number of people. But to what degree does this concept uh, actually exhaust the subject? I think to a very slight degree. There are still in the world a number of religions and systems, cultural and moral, uh, which originally involved astrology. <laughs> Most of these groups still involve it. And I think we can say with safety that three, about 350 million Hindus are at least sensitive to the astrological problem. They may not be working at it enthusiastically, but it is part of their way of life. We know, for example, that Mohandas Gandhi had his horoscope calculated when a baby, that he kept this document with him, and that in a strange way it was remarkably accurate, dating nearly all of the important incidents of his life. We also know that only very recently, in a death and replacement of a ruler in, in, in the Indo-Chinese area, that the coronation of the King of Laos uh, was postponed for nearly a year because the planetary aspects were not propitious. These things are still happening in many parts of the world. Another vast area that is sensitive to astrology, as in the case of the King of Laos, is the Buddhist world. And while it cannot be said that all Buddhists are enthusiastic in this department, it is again part of the tradition that has been handed down to them. And it does affect the governments and the administrations of nearly 40 Buddhist nations today. So perhaps we have an area, including these and other smaller groups, of persons essentially sensitive to astrology that would probably number in the neighborhood of one billion human beings. Now, on the problem of rebirth, 
or reincarnation and karma, we are working contemporaneously with about the same pattern, although I think we may say that this belief is held more generally and um, more solidly than the belief in astrology. So I think it is safe to say today that in the neighborhood of one billion to one and a quarter billion human beings now living accept the doctrine of rebirth and karma as a natural religious philosophy. This is, of course, largely true outside of the areas of our immediate experience, as most people are not keenly aware of the functions of foreign powers. I think we may also point out that down through history, both these doctrines, astrology and reincarnation, have been held together among some of the most brilliant peoples in the world's recording. Apparently, reincarnation was brought to uh, the attention of the Greek scholars as the result of their travels in the Far East. Among the pioneers in this, of course, was Pythagoras of Samos, who in about the 6th century B.C. seems to have brought this doctrine, the doctrine of reincarnation, strongly to the attention of the Greeks. Its greatest exponent in Greece, of course, was Plato and on the entire descent of the Platonic and Neoplatonic schools uh, was in harmony or in line with this general belief. Reincarnation and karma reached Rome as a result of Greek teachers setting up their academies in the capital of the Roman Empire. It also penetrated into Byzantium and into the great Eastern Empire of Rome. Thus we have a, a doctrine of great historical interest and one which perhaps could help us uh, in solving some of our more pressing immediate difficulties. We, I think, are entitled to regard this matter in a rather more sympathetic way than it has generally been handled. Not long ago, I knew a gentleman who was doing his doctoral thesis in religion in one of our largest universities. Um, he asked his committee to permit him to do his thesis on reincarnation. I think the committee was a little flabbergasted at the prospect, but having had a quiet session among themselves, the committee men reported favorably on the project. Uh, as educators, as leaders in a great university, they said the subject was entirely proper inasmuch as any subject is proper, which has held the esteem of the learned and the thoughtful for thousands of years and has had as large an influence on society as this one. The main problem was that such a thesis must be handled in a manner fitting to a doctorate degree. It must be carefully thought out, it must be adequately documented, and must indicate the research and thoughtfulness of the person preparing the thesis. The thesis was prepared, it was of the quality necessary, and the doctorate was awarded. So you can handle these subjects, even in our unbelieving world, if you want to handle them adequately. And I think that brings us to our uh, problem today, Namely, that believers in these things should not develop an inferiority complex on the grounds that they are isolated sufferers against a cruel world. Actually, nearly half the population of the world is on their side. And uh, the main issue always is to find out what these doctrines really are, to differentiate between popular belief and serious belief, and to investigate the various imponderables in a manner that is satisfactory to a sure knowledge or a real thoughtfulness in the area under consideration. What would you say, or how shall we say, that the contact between astrology and the idea of reincarnation was first strengthened? I believe that astrology contributed heavily to it 
in its gradual unfoldment of the sense of the way the universe operated. We may uh, have certain restrictions of view as to the validity of all astrological findings, but we do know that the priests of Chaldea and Babylon and the ancient sages of India studied the stars, studied thoughtfully and reasonably uh, the laws and rules governing universal process. Uh, they had a great advantage in this over our way of thinking. Today when we study, we go into a very congested classroom or a bustling library. We sit down and try uh, to find adequate texts, and we become part of a very tight system of acceptances and rejections. It was rather different in those days. These scholars simply went out by themselves into the wilderness sat down quietly on the side of a hill or climbed to the top of some ruined tower and just absorbed the universe into their own consciousness. They watched, they considered, they were not interrupted. No one really told them what to think or what to discover. They simply became receptive to the larger world, trying to understand with the faculties that had been given to them. Out of this quiet, meditative acceptance of the universe came most of the foundations of knowledge as we understand knowledge today. We have yet tried to find who taught the first great teachers, and we are convinced that to a measure they were taught by space itself. They simply remained accepting beings without dogma, without opinion, without prejudice, without intolerance. And by the very nature of their own souls, they were able to receive knowledge. They made mistakes, certainly, but they were grand mistakes, mistakes in uh, terms, perhaps, of seeing more than there was to see. Uh, but certainly they were kindly mistakes, uh, ever searching for better things, for greater truths, for greater beauty in the universe around them. One of the early observations of these ancient scientists, for they were scientists in their own time, one of their observations was the continuance of universal phenomena. Several of the Greeks wrote about this from their early recognitions. They suddenly found that they were in a universe in which nothing really began and nothing really ended. Instead of the concept that we have, uh, they, they felt a universe of organized motion, forever flowing in great cycles. These cycles were not circles. Creatures did not come back to a starting point. They cycled up and up in a strange mystic spiral, moving apparently in circles, but actually always returning to a higher level than that from which they started. The universe was a continuing interrelationship of cycles. Ezekiel called it wheels within wheels. And the early gazers into the mystery of space found in space only one thing, and that was life. They found life everywhere. They observed that this life was constantly changing its appearances, but its substance never changed. They recognized it as combining with patterns of itself to make innumerable diversity, yet the unity of this life itself never changed. And living under a heaven that moved in incredible arcs of time, yet with the recurrence of the annual season, the recognition that in the springtime life came out of the earth, uh, that life unfolded and developed and bore its fruit and its seed. And then it seems as though life died, but life did not die. And after the long, cold uh, months of winter, life came forth again in all its grandeur at the following equinox. Thus the system of the universe told something of birth and growth maturity and decline, of death and of resurrection. 
For in this mystery our ancient forebears saw forever resurrection, the restoration of life, and all their theologies and all their doctrines. And this extended down to the most primitive of peoples, recognized this mystery of life coming forth of life res restored and resurrected from the mystery of death. And those especially who inhabited what we call temperate zones were particularly aware of the continual uh, program or procession of life moving on through space. It became very difficult for these ancient peoples to take death seriously. Uh, they recognized naturally that forms die, but they recognized also that trees seem to die in winter. They realized that the human body could not be preserved as the tree was, although in some areas they tried their best to preserve the body through mummification and other religious rituals. But most of all, they came to the conviction that life was a reality and that anything that seemed to deny that reality was itself some way false or misunderstood. Thus the doctrine of the immortality of the human soul was certainly largely sustained and supported by the study of the universe. And most of all, not only was this immortality recognized, but that it was a lawful, reasonable immortality was also strongly believed. The ancients could not conceive of anything living for no purpose. They could not accept the idea that the life of the human being was an isolated experience. They could not assume that everything in nature was unfolding according to law, and man was a strange little separate creature that accomplished very little and hastened himself and his neighbors to an early grave. They did not um, admit that this could be true. They recognized, therefore, that in some way the life of man was important, that it was part of nature, that in man moved the same forces that moved the stars, that in man the same laws were unfolding that maintained the universe, and therefore that man had to be just as important as any other unit in the great universal system. This unit had to also have its own immortality because nothing really died. And out of all of these considerations uh, came the final conclusion that man as a being had a destiny with the destiny of all things, that he did not have a separate little destiny. Man was not created by a peculiar, separate procedure. He was not simply given domain over nature. He was nature. Nature existed in him. But he was given certain faculties and powers, not generally observable in other creatures. And by these very faculties and powers, he was given a certain leadership and was given the privilege, the opportunity, or the responsibility to cooperate in the natural processes of things. Man was the only creature that the ancient knew capable of cooperating consciously and intelligently with the purpose of universal destiny. This attitude led naturally to the enlargement of philosophy and religion morality and ethics. It led the ancients to create codes for the peculiar use of man, defining his powers and also affirming his responsibilities and his duties in nature. Now it was a common observation, of course, uh, that all creatures were born into a kind of nature were born into a world that was governed by the peculiar laws which we call natural law, as contrasted rather improperly with divine law. For our most ancient forebears believed there was only one kind of law, and that this law was manifested through two expressions, 
one being the laws of spirit and the other the laws of matter. But they were one great pattern operating on two levels of function. It was observed by these older peoples also that if men planted according to the seasons, their harvests flourished. But if they planted out of season, the plants did not grow properly. Therefore there was a time for all these things to happen, and that according to the timing of things, their destinies were unfolded. It was further observed by these people that in nature, particularly the plants and animals, mating was according to season, or that growth was according to season, or pollinization, or the casting of seed from plants was according to season. But in man, fertility was continuous. But this does not mean that there are not certain seasons that produce their own harvests. It was therefore only a step to assume that man was a highly diversified being, and that therefore many kinds of seasons existed for him, and that he was born in one period of the year, his destiny could unfold in one way, that if he was born in another period, that he came under a different group of seasonal processes, yet man was capable of maturing and fulfilling his destiny when born under any season. Thus seasons became not problems of life and death, but of directive, of the direction in which, in which things move, and how rapidly this motion can be accomplished. Naturally, our forebears were much concerned with the mystery of birth. To them, a life coming into the world was subject not merely to our biological considerations, but to things seen and observed by an empiric process. One thing that the Chinese noted at an early date, and so did other people, was a physical phenomenon of rather uh, amusing, but perhaps intriguing, import. Most small children, most newborn babes, have about them a strange and abstract look of age. There is nothing that looks much older than a brand new baby. It enters this world with the most quizzical and difficult expression. Although its features are yet ill-shapen, it has something about it of a meditating sage, of an ancient grandparent. It looks upon life with the pessimism of great years, even at the beginning, and expresses this pessimism usually by entering into this world in a fit of tears and howling. Also, one of the first things that happens to it when it gets here is to be spanked. In other words, it is only by punishment it seems to be able to live. All these things meant something to our remote ancestors. They were very observing. Uh, to them, all of these were symbols of some real process in nature. It was also soon observed that the small child coming into the world manifests, as it begins to coordinate, a kind of unworldly wisdom. Children are not just as ignorant and helpless as we would like to think they are. Physically, they have very little uh, to support them, and they are born less fortunately than the average animal. But in terms of culture and in terms of innate life, the ancients observed that children had a grasp of things, a grasp of value. And long before they were old enough to reason for themselves, they were able to ask questions that their elders could not answer. Thus it seems that the small child is born into this world with a natural inquiry, a desire to know, and that gradually, by the various processes of our way of life, uh, this natural hunger for learning is not fulfilled but stones are substituted for food, and by degrees this natural inquiry is blunted until the person, having reached the age of reason, begins to live unreasonably. This is the way in which we seek to solve this problem. It was inconceivable to the ancient peoples 
that this life in man, by which he was a living thing, was actually conferred by birth. It seemed to the ancient more definitely uh, that this child, this little one, uh, was more than a mere physical thing. That if it was simply physical, it would remain so. But somewhere in this newborn babe was locked the mystery of a Plato or an Aristotle or a Leonardo da Vinci or a Raphael or a Michelangelo. Something within this being, although the creature itself was small and of slight concern, yet there was within it something that could change the world. No one, no one could know what was locked in the soul of this newborn babe, whether it be a genius or a tyrant, whether it be great or mediocre. Only time, situations, and conditions could reveal. So the older peoples held this constant state of, ob of observing inquiry, of trying to understand the kind of creature that was coming to be part of their lives and homes. This led to further consideration of where this child could have been prior to its arrival here. Was it new? Was it something that had never existed before? Was it simply a product of the generative processes of its parents? Why did it come where it came? Why did one child come among the patricians and another among the commoners? Why was one born into the races that were dominant and others, another born into races that were subservient. There seemed to be no explanation for this, and yet it worked a strange and mysterious hardship upon the child. For if it was an unfortunate birth, this child was very heavily conditioned against success or against the maturity of its potentials. These things led to an effort to rationalize, to find some reason why a child was born into a peculiar destiny, why it was born into this world at all, uh, why if it was born it could not have been created by a creative fiat, the mere speaking of a word, why this creature had to pass through all these periods of growth and development in which it was a burden to others and itself, why it would later fall into decrepitude. These problems caused the individual to attempt to restore in his own thinking the divine plan operating in nature. Our older uh, philosophers and scholars realized that this plan itself had to be right, that whatever system of reasoning they used had to sustain the facts and also had to give to these facts overtones that were great enough to make life significant. Materialism would have been utterly inconceivable to these people because it was sterile, because it solved nothing, because it gave nothing to strengthen or unfold or develop the character or the integrity of the individual. To meet this problem then, there were only two or three possible answers. Either the child had to be a newborn babe coming into this world out of nothing by some strange and mysterious act of providence, or it could possibly be regarded as merely the projection of its ancestors, the continuing of a life thread from generation to generation, this thread conditioned always by that which had gone before. By this means or by this concept, the sins of the fathers descended unto the children unto the third and fourth generation. This was perhaps a neat bit of figuring, but it was a little hard on the children because it suddenly caused the individual's personal character to be victim to his forebears, and he was predestined and foreordained by a destiny over which he had no control uh, to be uh, slightly dishonest because one of his ancestors had been a celebrated buccaneer. This did not answer too much or give too uh, much reality to the problems of living. The only other answer seemed to be that the individual was here because of something that he himself had done. Now, this was a, a rather complicated situation, and it also uh, annoyed the Pharisees quite a bit during the period of the life of Jesus. 
And therefore Jesus is questioned as to whether or not it was this man's sins or his father's sins that caused him to be born blind. Now had there not been some question in the popular mind of the day, how would it have been framed that a man's own sins could have caused him to be born blind? The Pharisees, of course, generally held reincarnation. Therefore, their question evidently was pointed in this direction. Namely, that there was a possible explanation that the individual was fulfilling himself, that he was not a blind product of blind destiny, but an unfolding creature by whose very nature this unfoldment had to extend over a longer period of time than the opportunities of any one life could provide. Now this is interesting because the Greeks and the Chaldeans were working on it. Uh, for example, we have something we study today called history. Now history is the unfoldment of the activities of human beings over long periods of time. It is a record of the growth of races and of nations and of systems and of the rise of individuals of prominence. Yet most persons living today can only read history of any time except their own. Some people would kind of wish they could have been born perhaps in the golden age of Greece where they could have studied with Pythagoras or Plato and Aristotle. Others would like to be born a thousand years from now when they hope we will have more common sense than we have today and that our affairs will go better. One of the most common things to observe is that the individual is not quite certain that he was born in the most fortunate period. This has been common to all periods and every generation has questioned the delight of belonging uh, to a larger historical cycle. But if there is any importance in history, if the experience of the race from the beginning is meaningful, what does this mean? It means that humanity is moving through a vast cycle of time. There have been some recent revisions by anthropologists as to the probable age of the human being in nature. Not long ago it was a comparatively short cycle. Today, anthropology has decided that man has been here as man not less than a million years, perhaps longer. It'll probably be five or ten million years one of these days. We are pushing this boundary back. In any event, man is here for a long experience, and history is the unfolding of our reaction to every kind of stimuli. It is the story of the growth of our governments, the growth of our arts and sciences, the growth of our cultures, the unfoldment of our religions, and the gradual enrichment of our arts and crafts. All of these things are continually unfolding and will do so into the future. And in the midst of this, at any moment, we place man as an individual with 70 or 80 years of expectancy if he keeps off the freeways. This situation seems to mean that the individual at any one time is framed by past and present and like an unrolling scroll only a little part of which is seen at a time his own life is rounded by an unconsciousness he has no distinct relation to the past except in terms of a book he can read he has no relation to the future except in the thought that perhaps his descendants will be better than he is. Yet how is this going to contribute to the perfection of the human being now? The only answer is that man is not going to be perfect now, according to this concept. That the human being is going to live and die as a tiny segment in a process of universal motion. What does this accomplish? Supposing there is some place in space where those who have accomplished in various ages rest on their levels of accomplishment where somewhere in the background was a highly benevolent very kindly well disposed old witch doctor he had lived perhaps long before the age of reason as we know it and the best he could do was rattle a few bones and uh, say a few prayers or magical incantations over the sick of his tribe but still he was well loved and well honored in his day. There he is. 
Thousands of years have passed, but he is gone. And if he is resting anywhere in space, he is still what he was. There seems to be no way of changing this. He would have a little difficulty in communicating adequately with the, a scholar from the golden age of Pericles. He would be a man with great erudition, great understanding, great sympathy, but with perhaps a rather limited perspective on the things that modern people consider to be essential. He would be on his level. He could scarcely uh, really fraternize uh, pleasantly with the witch doctor who would not understand him, even though he might understand the witch doctor. Then there would be modern man with his arts, his sciences, his machines, his uh, projectiles into space, his innumerable gadgets and commodities, his modern attitudes on everything. He would seem to be the apex of something at the moment, the apex of emergency, but we hope to get by. But uh, 10,000 years from now, where will he be? He will simply be part of the experimental dust of the past. Others will build upon whatever contributions he left and hope to correct whatever mistakes he made. But he is gone. Thus man himself, in this great process, observes the total unfoldment of his species. He sees his own kind moving triumphantly from one experience to another, but actually he can never share in it. He can only share in a little thing called now, and then he is gone. And in his going, he loses all contact with what appears to be the purpose of existence, and that is the unfoldment of man. Humanity unfolds, man dies. This is one of the scientific adages of our time. The collective gradually enriches, but the individual forming the collective may perish as impoverished as he was born. Such did not please ancient thinking. They said it just won't work. If that's the way it is, we might as well all lie down now and end the process. Actually, there has to be some way in which the individual life moves with the great motion of existence. And to meet this, the ancients created the doctrine of rebirth. So that the individual, even though today he has no memory of the past, yet he was the past. This great story of history is his story. The story of an unfolding consciousness moving through the infinities of time. That man himself passes through this whole great pattern. And the duration of humanity, whether it be one million years or ten million years or a thousand million years, this duration of humanity is also the duration of the individual. That he himself is part of a great wave of life. That this life wave is forever moving. And that he moves with it. Sometimes he moves with it visibly. Sometimes he moves with it invisibly. Sometimes he belongs to that part of the wave of life which is embodied Sometimes he belongs to that part which is not embodied. But we know there is an unembodied part because it is forever producing bodies. Therefore, man belongs either to the production or to the power which causes production. He is either among those things now manifested or he sleeps waiting manifestation in that power which manifests all things. This seemed to make good common sense pattern uh, to individuals who had the peculiar sense of honesty. Honesty has something to do with the rights of things, the rights of life, the privileges, opportunities, and duties of life. It does not seem entirely proper to these older peoples uh, that man should ever experience what he does not deserve. They had no concept in those days of man being forgiven everything and allowed to do as he pleases. Uh, the ancient realized that man could make mistakes, that he would make mistakes. But they also came to the conclusion that mistakes are not as big as life. That, that life and history record infinite varieties of mistakes. But life goes on. Some men make great wars, but life goes on. Some have been despots, some have been fools, but life goes on. 
Therefore the mistakes man makes are little things, but his life is a great thing, the only thing that endures. He can hurt himself, he can squeeze himself into a philosophy unfit for him, he can injure his own character, he can bring down upon himself the punishments of society, he can commit crime for which he must in due time uh, do penalty, but he cannot destroy the life in himself. This has to go on. He cannot destroy it, nor can anyone else. For if any human being can destroy the life in any other human being, there is no justice in the universe. And the ancients, seeking ever for justice, could only come to the conclusion that justice was possible because there could be no accidents. Nothing that appeared to be accidental could in the final analysis interfere with the basic program of the infinite unfoldment of life. Most ancient peoples never attempted to define the ultimate. They did not know or could not tell where man was going. The only thing they could believe was that man was getting better and that whatever he built, he would build continually from greater insight and greater experience and at the remote ends of things, man would come to the fulfillment of his potential, which means that he would be capable of a continuing virtuous existence in place or in space, in time or in eternity. Obviously, this began to move in in terms of inquiry. Ancient man began to try to understand in some way uh, this plan and how he could cooperate with it. For in old times, men liked to think of cooperating with the universe. They liked to uh, have the idea that they did obey rather than that they had freedom to be disobedient. They had already observed that this freedom for disobedience led only to tragedy. The great moral structure of the human race was created before men could read or write but was created out of the continuing observation of the experiences of existence. So man came at least into this world at a time called birth. Whether it was his first birth or his 500th birth, he was here. He came here not, however, entirely helpless in character, perhaps more helpless in body. And as body began to grow, it seemed to provide greater means for the expression of the life within it. And no matter how much man grew, this life grew also, giving him a continual power to direct his own character and his own conscience, giving him the incentives and the dreams and the ideals to build a better world for himself and others. Thus it was life growing through body that became the redeemer of the race became the hope of glory for all the children of the earth. And when the time came for the child to make its appearance in this world, it was customary to bring the physician, or at least to make careful note in the ancient water clock or whatever system was used of the time of this birth. In an important birth, certainly the physician was present, and the physician was also the astronomer. He carefully noted the hour the minute and the time by the best methods available to him. He observed the positions of the heavens, and it was his usual process to immediately retire, either the same night or the following night if the child was born in the daytime, make the necessary calculations, and observe the positions of the heavens directly from the sky itself. From this uh, process, with simple instruments, he prepared the nativity of the newborn child. This nativity was then solemnly presented to the family as a guide in the development of the character of that child. And it would be quite wrong to assume that all these nativities were encouraging. They were not. The faithful physician astronomer uh, told what he believed to be true. If he saw fatality, he told it. If he saw danger, he un unfolded it. He did not simply prepare flattering documents, and many of the older nativities which I have examined are far from optimistic. They were not simply flattering productions. They were the serious efforts of the 
uh, interpreter to try to find what was actually there according to the science he worked with and according to the rules that had come down to him from time immemorial. It was, however, assumed in many areas that this nativity was not simply the story of the beginning of something. It was a story of the coming of an eternal life into a temporal state for a while. Thus the nativity, as was it, as it was set forth, seemed to carry with it something that has always been difficult for us to accept or to understand, namely a prophetic quality. A quality which implied that the individual's life was at least under a certain general direction. That when he was of a certain age, it was most likely he would do certain things. That he would be subject to certain dangers. Also that he had certain potentials or powers specially developed, which might lead him to a certain profession or craft or trade. These things were discovered from the geniuture of the child at birth. And thousands and thousands of cases are on record in which these predictions have been startlingly and amazingly accurate. This, of course, led our ancestors to the brink of another dilemma, namely the danger of a fatalistic attitude toward life. If these things could be predicted, then man was not a free agent. He was in some way in bondage. And it was necessary then to explain how a person could build his own career and yet be subject to fatality beyond his control. It was in this process of consideration and thought that the doctrine of reincarnation and karma moved in upon the astrological field and gave it a certain new directive. The philosophy has developed many schools of thought, one of which uh, was developed very strongly in the thinking of Aquinas, the great Catholic philosopher. And that was that man had a certain limited determinism. That the human being, while within a great pattern of laws, has a power of choice. That he has a certain ability to choose between various potential possibilities that he may choose to go in or to the house or not to go into the house, to cross the street or not to cross the street. He has this power to choose certain things, which led Ptolemy of Alexandria, the father of modern astrology, to declare that the stars impel but do not compel. This limited determinism, however, this power to choose, is not quite as general as we might suspect because while we have the power to choose we must choose with such powers of mind as we have an individual cannot choose that which he has never heard of he cannot or will not choose that for which he has a definite distaste he will not choose that which is contrary to his inclinations or his convictions, except perhaps in a great emergency. But even in an emergency, his own determinism has something to say. Even in emergency, the individual can only meet this emergency with what he is. He cannot meet it with what someone else is. Thus, out of his own psychic integration must come this power of limited determinism which probably really means that he hesitates, weighs, comes upon certain conflict in his own nature, straightens this conflict the best he can, and finally reaches the only decision possible considering what he is. Thus what he is must always be the principal factor in his decision, even though it may appear to be a complete product of free will. It is not free will. It is only the possible decision that he can make 
in the face of all that he is, all that he has been, and all of the factors that have become involved in his personal psychology. But if the individual uh, facing the future of life is regarded as being born as an individual, born at some point in the midstream of his own actual existence, and that therefore he is the coming into manifestation of a being that has manifested before and will manifest again. Therefore, that we are measuring a cycle in the life of a, of a being that is a being. And uh, astrology uh, does try very definitely to point this out. Because on the day of the child's birth, its general natural aptitude may be determined. Whether or not it is fitted for art or science may be determined. Whether it is going to be healthy or perhaps a precarious constitution is also determined. Consequently, the individual is born with a character, born with a destiny, born with a condition. And the only way in which this can be honorably and honestly true is that this individual is born at a certain stage in the growth of himself and that therefore behind him are things which he has done before him are things which he has not done and according to the degree of his own integrity he comes in strengthened or weakened in resolution and capacity as the chart is able to distinguish these differences the ancients assumed it to be quite natural that such differences existed and that human beings should be different must imply that they have a reason for this difference, not merely the whims of nature or the biological uh, or chemical imbalances of their ancestors. There has to be a reason why the person is that person. It has not only to be a good reason, it has to be a valid reason. And most of all, this reason must glorify the universe, justify universal law, and present the individual with nothing but that which is honest, reasonable, and proper. The individual cannot have as a reason that he is a victim of providence. He cannot have as a reason that he was born to suffer. He cannot have as a reason that he is merely doing penance. He has to have a reason which leads to a greater degree of good. The law of karma coming in with this same situation has been a little difficult for many people. And yet many who have come upon it for the first time have sensed the strange integrity uh, with which it is enriched. The law of karma is simply the law of cause and effect applied to the moral growth and conduct of the individual. It means that conduct is a result of previous conduct, that future conduct will arise from present conduct. It implies furthermore that the individual coming into life brings with him both his accomplishments and his debilities, brings in his understanding and his lack of understanding, that in some mysterious way he begins life where once he left it off and must now continue uh, to experience those forms of growth and meet those challenges of character which perhaps he was inclined to reject at some earlier time. A great number of individuals uh, sort of feel that death is a release from the problems of existence. By the time they've had 60, 70, or 80 years of this world, a rest looks rather tempting. But there is a certain weariness. And also some people get themselves into such incredible situations that little short of death can get them out of it. But these situations which they hope to thus solve 
by cutting the Gordian knot of life itself, or these debts left un uh, unpaid uh, to be assumed by others, or these poor judgments which have affected the lives of others. Somewhere, sometime, the individual has to pick up the threads of his own insufficiency. He has to realize that as he sows, so shall he reap. And as most cases, we do not observe the reaping, uh, at least not its complete expression, in any one lifetime. This morality implies a continuance of life. And this continuance could have no moral meaning if it was a continuance in some other region where the affairs of this life are not valid. If an individual makes a mistake in one situation, it is hardly important or valuable for him uh, to be placed in a completely different situation in which all that he has previously known or learned becomes meaningless. Everything in nature is meaningful. If we are here as we are here to meet the challenge of this life. The ancients believed we will remain here or return here until we have met this challenge, that the only final departure from this form of life lies in the conquering of this form of life, that the individual can outgrow life, but he can never walk out of it. He can never escape from it. He must fulfill it. And as he cannot possibly do so in any one embodiment, nature, if it has a purpose in placing him here, and has a determination to fulfill that purpose, and this is strongly suggested by history, then it must be necessary for man to be here until the job is done. Many people feel that the doctrine of karma is a sort of negative fatalism that it means that we must always go on making mistakes. But here the ancients came back to their cyclic laws and pointed out that the individual, though he may return here, will never be born twice the same. He must in every instance be enriched in some way by previous existence. Therefore his life is cyclic. Even though he has resisted growth through the entire years of an embodiment, he has ultimately been forced to face his own mistake. He can grow by positive acceptance of progress, or he can grow by the gradual negative realization of the tragedy that he brings upon himself. But grow he must. Nature has so ordained, and the stars in their courses have fulfilled this purpose to the ancient thinkers. Having come to this parallelism by which astrology becomes the instrument of determining the immediate destinies of individuals, pointing out the strength and weakness of character, where they have natural tendencies which could cause difficulty, where certain phases of their nature have been highly developed and others neglected, so that in a way if this subject could be completely handled, it would be the story of man's present state, based upon the fact that this state itself becomes the power moving into embodiment. The individual is moved into embodiment by what Plato calls the principle of necessity. Therefore, he is born in a time and at a place when that which is necessary is possible. He is moved into embodiment by the very need of his own consciousness. And this need, moved by nature and by the exact machinery of the universe, causes him to be born in that time and in that place in which these needs can most immediately be met. And every part of his composition, biological and psychological, is keyed to his need. And therefore he is born when he is born and where he is born because of what he is. This seems to produce a very great need for an exactitude in the universe. And we have come to hope so desperately that there are accidents, and that one of these accidents would enable us to enjoy something we haven't earned, that we hate to face the simple facts of a completely ordered universe. But if we look out into space, to the immense galaxies of life evolving there, 
If we look down through a microscope into the infinite diversity of minutia, if we study the cellular structure of our own bodies, if we examine the structure of the atom and the electron, we must finally come to the realization that in nature an exactitude is always possible, that a complete and entire accuracy, a complete and perfect integration of all values is the common and natural expression of nature's way, that nature in the construction of forms moves by a skill and wisdom which transcends imagination, and that in the infinite life which nature sustains there is evidence of infinite law infinitely manifesting. So the problem of getting a human soul to the place where it belongs would no more tax nature than we would find nature unable to cope with the rotations and axes of atoms. Thus these problems present no real difficulty if we assume in nature an absolute law absolutely operating. It wasn't long in the course of the struggles of things that the doctrine of reincarnation and karma began to uh, intrigue the astrologer in another way. Would it be possible, is it conceivable, that from the chart of the individual it would be, a, you would be able to tell something of where it came from and something of where it might be going? In India this is a common procedure, and in Eastern astrology in general uh, the problem of a previous embodiment is assumed to be a correct or proper astrological consideration. On what ground would this uh, be regarded as valid in the terms of astrology? It is not valid only in terms of astrology, but theoretically, in particularly ancient thinking, it would be valid of any form of character analysis. It would be valid in every psychological test that we use today. Because actually these tests tell what we are. What we are tells very largely where we came from and how long it took us to get to where we are now. It is obvious also that from these tests it is possible to distinguish what might be termed more rapid or less, that less rapid advancement among people. We know that today there is an equality of potential, but not an equality of power. We know that individuals are spiritually derived of the same substance and essence, and that, have, and that they have the same hope of glory, all of them. Yet it is something that would cause us to remi remember that in school, uh, children passing through various grades and moving up through schooling do not all arrive at identically the same points. They do not all achieve the same grades, although they have had the same instructors. Generally speaking, we note that the child who wants to learn has the best grades. There may be exceptions in cases where there are physical or psychological handicaps, but in total, in general, the eager student, willing to give time and thought to instruction, becomes the better student whereas the one who begrudges his education uses every possible effort to evade the assignments that are given to him, would rather play than work. This individual consistently does not have as good grades. Now it's the same way in life. We look around us. We see a few people who are industrious, thoughtful, well-intentioned, trying their best to live good lives. We, other, we find others to whom this life is simply a period of romping, they only want to have fun from the cradle to the grave, and because of this desperate effort are usually miserable most of the time. We know that in all probabilities in the past, some of us were pretty eager students and others were a constant problem to the truant officer or his equivalent. Uh, we also know that some individuals had a natural aptitude for certain studies, others did not. And now we observe these markings in the newborn child. We are unable to explain why a great musician should arise in a family which for five generations has never been able to carry a tune. 
We have no way of knowing or understanding how it is that from some great and noble family of long and illustrious uh, ancestry and of every opportunity have come some of the most highly schooled morons we have ever produced. We have no reason of knowing or understanding why the privileged do not avoid crime, why the underprivileged can attain virtue. These things we just do not find answers for except a rather blasé expression of, well, that's the way it is. Uh, when we get a little deeper into it, however, we have every reason to feel that if the person is responsible for his own action, if we are what we have made ourselves to be, whether it be good or bad, we are all self-made, and we all have some more work to do. Whatever this situation is, the only honest and equitable answer is that whatever we have done, we must face. Whatever mistakes we have made, we must correct. And if we wish to graduate, we must do the work that is assigned to us. And it may take longer for some to get around to it. Others perhaps have achieved more rapidly. For some of the noblest souls in humanity that we have ever known have passed out of this world more than 2,000 years ago. Yet at the same time, in the terms of that which is to be known, they were the first to admit their own limitations. So we, uh, we have a world which, if we are moving according to law, can be a pretty good world, a world of fairness and justice, and a world that might be of great value to our modern thinking. I have a strong suspicion that the present generation could truly become aware of the principles of reincarnation and karma and would accept these as basic doctrinal facts that would have a very important effect upon current history and might do a great deal to prevent individuals from breaking laws or practicing tyrannies which sometime they must pay for. It is this wonderful hope of modern man that he is going down to the quietude of the grave and that his honors will be here and that he has no future to worry about or to fear that allows a great deal of despotism to flourish among us. If the individual, if the dictator, the tyrant knew that he had to live it out in space and eat it out in his own heart. He wouldn't be worried about the strength of his enemies. He would be worried about the weakness of himself. And this would be a most desirable situation. I think it would do, for instance, Mr. Khrushchev, Mr. Castro, a world of good if they suddenly became devout followers of reincarnation and karma. And it might do quite a little good to some of the people who are under the influence of these men. And it wouldn't do at all, it wouldn't do a bit of harm either for a large number of our own industrialists and economists and political leaders to be indoctrinated with the same ideas. I think it might cause the foundation of something we very much need, and that is a lasting peace. Because it is only the lasting peace that can bring peace to the human soul. It is only when we find the answers to right conduct and move quietly with nature that we can flow back into birth with a kind of destiny that will give us a happy, serene, and secure existence. It is perfectly possible to be happy in this world, but you have to earn the right. And you have to earn the right uh, by graduating from a school of misery, a school that is based simply upon ignorance and compromise. So I think these old ideas could have some meaning for us right now. In Eastern astrology, the effort has been made to, to indicate how this particular problem could work. And for those who are a bit astrologically minded, uh, we can uh, say that in the traditional forms of astrology, astrology has many schools today, but in the traditional forms that have come down to us from the past, uh, the ascendant or the so-called first house of a horoscope, the sign ascending on the eastern horizon at the moment of birth, is said to be the ruling sign of that chart, not the sign in which the sun is located according to the birthday. On this eastern angle, therefore, the ancients and the East Indian astrologers placed what they termed the now point. At the moment of that ascendant, we were born. 
and we were born into the present life of ourselves. We were born into the present cycle of our experiences, and into this cycle we brought something. No one comes empty-handed into this world. We all bring something. We all bring some potential. I have uh, been discussing a little of this problem with some uh, rather outstanding people in the field of child psychology, and they are beginning to accept more and more generally that it is impossible to assume that the child is born with a consciousness like a nice clean sheet of blank paper. There's someone been scribbling on it before it got here. <laughs> the child is a neurotic or not a neurotic the day it is born. Now under certain conditions, a wise family or fortunate uh, relationships may cause this neurotic child to slowly straighten out part of its own disaster, may never become overwhelmingly neurotic, perhaps because the overwhelming phase of its neurosis was not commanded by its destiny. But if completely neglected, that child can become very neurotic, which may also well mean that that child had this powerful neurotic tendency and society provided it with an opportunity to be itself, which is the greatest challenge that can face anything. But regardless, this child is born with a nature and a temperament. All that a parent can do is to strengthen this temperament, to observe it, to give it all natural possible assistance in those early years when the child is unable to function on its own. The parent, however, cannot create a temperament, nor can it completely frustrate a temperament. The temperament is there, but it can be inclined. And as this is inclined in one way or another, the possibilities of the child bringing positive values to bear upon its problems may be increased, but always the parent must work with the available reservoir of potential that that child brings. It is the leadership by the parent, the understanding of how to use this potential that is important. And many modern people have found astrology very helpful in this particular form of guidance. Now, if the first house of the chart does represent the child coming into life, then according to some systems of ancient astrology, the twelfth house, which precedes the first, and uh, becomes, is the sign preceding the one uh, which is ascending, could well represent uh, the previous life of the person. In Western astrology, as taught by such early masters as Lily and, um, the, and Gadbury, the twelfth house was a house of secret things, of sickness, of imprisonment, of exile, and of the so-called negative destinies of things, if they apply to the individual. It's a sort of house in which uh, the larger misfortunes of the life are outlined according to Western astrology. To the Eastern, this represents that which was the previous type of embodiment. Therefore, by turning the wheel of a chart so that the twelfth house is moved to the ascendant, it was the belief of many peoples that a general indication of the previous life of the individual could be found that it would then be the kind of a horoscope that that individual might have had the last time he was born. That at least it represents to degree that which has gone before, because the twelfth house represents the submerged part of the present character. Therefore it was this submerged part which must have previously been objective, or upon which the individual built all of his previous existence. Thus, in a way, we can get the concept of what the challenge might have been, how we could have failed or how we did succeed in the unfoldment of character. Also, that here lie certain potentials, both of strength and weakness, 
which unless we do something with them will continue to haunt us. Also in this house, the twelfth, we find the indications of the karmic debt which the person carries with him, the unfinished business which is nearest to the surface. Always this karmic debt has to be in terms of the actual development of the person. It can only be such part of this debt as is applicable to his present state of consciousness. But these things are believed to have an association with this aspect of the twelfth house. So that if there's unfinished business or there is a pressure, there is a need to do things, that this need is some way delineated or clarified by the twelfth house by moving it and making it a kind of ascendant and then reading the new chart thus created planets and so forth left as they are in the natal chart by the same degree of thinking the future would be indicated by the house following the first which is the second house of the chart we consider this house now as the chart or house of wealth or success but to the ancients this was much more it was the house of the fulfillment of right destiny it had to do with what we gain by keeping the law how rich we become by paying our own debts and not making more so true wealth in philosophy is not what we have but what we are and this is determined as part of the wealth concept uh, which of course in Europe got entirely sidetracked so that it only came to mean how much money you had in the bank well how much have we got in the bank of the universe it becomes a, a very moot question as we live along through the years so in this situation astrology works with the idea of reincarnation and karma they operate as a kind of pattern each interlocking with the other and if we use either we can gain a greater insight into the other because we can recognize the great precession of life the great motion of ages we can say to ourselves perhaps great cultures come back great racial motions are reborn because the entities in them much of the same quality move on very closely the same time cycles therefore it is quite possible that we may find the rebirth of the Roman Empire the rebirth of the philosophic states of Greece the rebirth of the golden era of Asiatic philosophy these cycles come in cycles of war and conquest return we sometimes wonder how it happens that the world was so enriched with music in the 19th century when there lived together some of the finest musicians the world has ever known or in the 18th century for outside of these 200 years the musical contributions of Western culture have been comparatively negligible its great work was done then I was reading a work on Chinese art not long ago by a distinguished Chinese culturist, a man of great discrimination. He said the arts of China had a cycle that was complete in themselves, that this cycle was born about the 4th century A.D. This cycle died about the 10th century A.D. And from that time on, practically no actual creativity in Chinese art not that China essentially vanished or anything of that nature but from then on it was mostly copying mostly the reproduction of older work we may say the same in certain forms of architecture the great era of architecture extended into the period of two to four thousand BC even today our architecture does not touch these ancient works therefore there seems to be cycles and periods and time there are periodic outbreaks of great wars periodic returns of natural disasters all these things seem to move in cycles and these cycles have to be tied into a great system of world ethics and world culture this system we know exists but the very scientific aspect of it offers again further stimulation and while we know that cause and effect 
is operating through space from the beginning of time. We have needed need of a clock to measure the time, to create the great pattern of mathematical sequences. Astronomy is that clock, because it is only the astronomical clock that can measure ages. It is only by some great system of chronology uh, like the Platonic cycles that we can begin to estimate these vast periods of time. Through astronomy, therefore, we have the measure of the outworking of the law. We have the pattern set up by which we can measure the relationship of events, estimate their frequencies, and arrive at a certain scientific control of events. All of these things work together, and I believe that either phase of the subject extended to its natural ends would give us amazing confidence in the universality of natural law, its justice, and how an understanding of these factors could help us now by giving us fuller inducements to live honorable lives, to accept our responsibilities with dignity, uh, to see shifting responsibilities, and to settle down to the real purpose for which we are here, namely a quiet program of self-improvement and mutual cooperation for the preservation and protection of everything that we regard as valuable and good. By such a simple scientific pattern with its ennobled background of great dreams and convictions, a scientific law based in idealism and not in materialism, a great pattern recognized as the production of a universal mind all wise and all good, and not merely the result of humanistic accidents. If we can begin to feel these larger rules and laws, I think we will be encouraged to find real answers for real problems, to stand for principles which we know to be right, and to gain inward consolation from the realization that we are here to grow, and that it is a blessed privilege to be able to work together in this schoolroom of life. Well, time is up. Time is up.